songs. Appreciate hearing the songs by Isaac Watts, Fanny Crosby, and, and uh, many others who, through their own life experiences, were able to share uh, much of God's Word in song. And it's just a wonderful thing to come and to uh, sing those songs. I want to continue my series I started probably a year ago. I started out with what I entitled The Call of Moses, and somehow I ended up so far at the moral glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those two are related. Somehow I, I got there. I'm not sure how. I'd have to go back and check my notes and find out, figure out just exactly what I did to take... Um, 20 or 30 left turns in a row, or maybe right turns, I'm not sure which. Uh, but we're going to continue today in, in the, considering the moral glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that we did was we went to Leviticus, and the first six or seven chapters talked about the Levitical offerings. Each one of those offerings has something that is very peculiar to itself, and it demonstrates something of great importance concerning the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one that I picked to look at was the meal offering in Leviticus chapter 2. The meal offering has no blood. It has no blood because the meal offering... It's called the meat offering in the King James. The meal offering consisted, the basic ingredient was fine flour. Fine flour is flour that has been ground and sifted and reground and resifted such that it is just the finest and the purest uh, consistency that you could buy to cook with. And we noted from this particular offering that this represented the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that every trial he endured, but demonstrated how fine he had been ground and how acceptable he was to God the Father. The meal offering was bloodless. Therefore, the meal offering showed the perfect blameless, sinless, spotless Lamb of God. You see, you couldn't take just any lamb to offer it. Mm -hmm. It had to be one perfect. Now, the high priest, as they would inspect those lambs, they would watch it walk. They would look at it to see if it was uh, had sight in both eyes. They would watch it walk to see that it didn't limp. Uh, uh, it couldn't be a runt. It, it couldn't be an oddity. It couldn't be a castaway, a throwaway. And as far as the human eye could see, that lamb was perfect. But we all know that many lambs were sacrificed that internally were not perfect. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ, internally, as to his moral character, as to his essential deity, this Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was absolutely perfect in everything that he did and everything that he said and every thought that he possessed was moral perfection. And this, when he offered himself, when he offered his own life to God, was a sweet-smelling savor to God. And that's why I printed the first verse on the sheet. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to who? To God. For what reason? A sweet smelling savor. Beloved brother and sister here this morning, I don't think we smell that. I don't think our our finite yet redeemed noses can really understand what that means. There was something you see in the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ of his own life to God 
that only God could appreciate. Oh, did we benefit from it? Yes, we did. Hallelujah. We have salvation because of the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am hidden in him. And when God looks at Dan Lindstedt, instead of seeing the wretched sinner that he was and continues to be, yes. God sees the Lord Jesus Christ on my behalf. And that's perfection. Mm -hmm. A sweet-smelling Savior. Now, you know, Melissa had three children. Melissa, were you just a perfect child when you grew up? Did you do everything right? <laughs> Am I a perfect child now? No. <laughs> okay, so she had Willow and Jaden and Orion. Now, these were per everything they did was just gone. I gotta go there. Okay, you know, we all have had this experience. Can you imagine someone that everything that they did and everything they said was absolutely perfect? Divinely perfect. You know, I think probably one of the most perplexed persons in this world would have had to have been Mary, the mother of Jesus. Can you imagine living in a household where one child, and only one child, absolutely did everything perfect? That would have really been something. I can't imagine that. And I'm looking at my oldest son, David, there. Uh, that's just something that very hard for us to relate to. But when we consider the moral glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that he did was perfect. This is going to grab our attention. And I hope that this is only the thing that grabs our attention. It will direct where you go to church and what you expect of your church. It will guide your life. It is the most important thing when it comes to living your life in this world, first of all, to see the moral perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be focused on him as the bullseye. That meal offering was fine ground flour, and it had frankincense in it, a white substance from the root, of a tree, and that spoke of his deity. This sacrifice was made with salt, and salt speaks of righteousness, it speaks of active righteousness, it speaks of eternal righteousness. So this, this fine meal could have frankincense, it had to have salt, it could not have leaven, which speaks of sin, or could it have honey, and we've talked at length about honey. What is honey? Honey is natural sweetness. We need natural sweetness because we're natural people. The Lord Jesus Christ did not need honey. He was divine. Everything he said, everything he did was absolutely perfect. In his treatment with everything, including his siblings, his mother, his disciples, was absolutely perfect. I'm not. Guess what? I make people mad. I offend people, and, and I have to say, well, I'm sorry. You know, I really, I really said something that wasn't good, and so I apologize. That, that, that's honey. You know, your, your child comes home, and they've got their first little... A kindergarten drawing, uh, and you know, you look at it, and what do you say? You say, oh my goodness, what is that? <laughs> is that what you say? Oh, this, is, this looks like another uh, Albert Einstein. I mean, this looks like, th this is just the most beautiful thing that I've, we're going to frame it, we're going to put it on the fridge, that is just gorgeous. That's honey. Did you ever have someone accuse you of something you didn't do? And rather than look them in the, them in the eye and say, I did not do that, nor did I mean that, what did you do? In graciousness, because we're, neither party is divine in character, we do what? 
Have you ever had to apologize for something you didn't do or didn't mean? Yeah, you have. That's honey. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his moral perfection, did not need honey. So there was no honey, you see, in that sacrifice. He never had to apologize. Think about that. You search the scriptures. He never apologized. Why? He was perfect Amen. in everything that he did and everything that he said. And even his own brothers and his own mother. He would not, he did not need to apologize. He says, I need to be about my father's. That was the priority. We don't do that. We find ourselves ducking for cover and, and hiding behind a, a, an excuse or whatever it is because we're not morally perfect. Now we're redeemed. We have a new nature, but we do not have divine nature. We have a new nature, praise God. Everything he ever said was spoken in truth and in love. Now, our last session, we considered a fact. Knowing, K-N-O-W-I-N-G, knowing that he always dealt impeccably with people. How do we react with his dealings regarding ourselves? If we can look at the scriptures and see how people reacted to him and how he was in the lives of his disciples and those around him, when something happens in our life, how then, knowing the moral perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ, how then do we evaluate those things that happen in our life? Well, you could turn to Mark 6, but on your sheet I have printed uh, Mark 6 and, and John 6, and we're going to refer to this uh, mostly. But in Mark chapter 6 we see the most typical teaching directed towards the feeding of 5,000 people. That's a wonderful miracle, isn't it? And in Mark 6 also, you have Peter trying to walk on the water, but he flubbed up, didn't he? And so those, when, you, when you, someone teaches from Mark chapter 6, this is where they normally go. These are the main attractions, so to speak, from Mark 6. But we noticed something else last time in Mark 6, and I think it pays to do a little review. The disciples came to the Lord Jesus Christ after he and they had been preaching all day. The people had followed them and wanted to hear more, and finally they departed to a deserted place so that they could eat. They didn't even have time to eat. Now, if I don't eat in a day or two, I get kind of grouchy. <laughs> And you know, here they were, they're tired and it's hot, you know, where they were. And they went to a, a desert place, a, a deserted place. And guess what? The crowds followed them. They wanted to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the disciples said, Lord, in, in the, I think it was like verse, uh, I forget what verse it was exactly. He said, uh, 36, the disciples looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and they said, please, Lord, send them away. There's no food for them to eat. There's no housing here. Send them into the villages to get food and to, and to, to get some rest. Lord, we're just being, we're tired. Can you imagine following the Lord Jesus Christ around all that time and hearing all those messages and being with all those people, pushing and shoving, wanting to be healed? And what does the Lord Jesus Christ say? He said, oh, you guys are right. That's right. The union requires no. He says, what is he saying? He says, let's give him something to eat. And the disciples said, Lord, don't you understand? We have some needs too. I wonder if we, when things happen to us, do we kind of look at God and say, you know what? Are you ignoring me? Don't you understand? You know, I have some needs too. What does the Lord do? He says, I want you to go out there to regiment them, and I want you to seat them in a grassy place. He was considered about the comfort of those 5,000 people plus. And he said, I want you to give them to eat. 
And after we've given them to eat, I want you to clean up. I want you to go and gather up all the fragments of the food. Lord, don't you understand? We haven't eaten ourselves. We're tired. We're worked to the bone. And so what did the Lord do? He sent them away. And where did he send them? On a boat. And what happened to them in that boat? A storm came. Tired and hungry, serving double time, feeding the thousands, picking up the scraps after them, complaining that the Lord has ignored them because they have no rest, they have no food, and so the Lord sends them away and sends them into a storm. What kind of a God is that? Sometimes, you know, I look at my, my life and I see what's happening, especially in, in the political scenario of these United States, and I say, I don't understand. I, I, I think something, there's just something I'm not seeing here. God, you just don't seem to be playing fair. Do you ever feel like that? He sends them into a storm. You know what? The multitude needed someone, didn't they? They needed the Lord Jesus Christ. And the disciples really couldn't see that. And so what does the Lord do? He sends them into a storm. Now who has a need? You see that? Now who has a need? They have a need, you see, in that storm. Now, why did he send them into that storm? Now, this interesting scenario that we talked about. Remember, and the storm came, and, and they, they perceived something walking on the water, and the scripture says they thought him to be a spirit, and the word there for spirit, remember, was phantasma. Phantasma, which we get our word fantasy from. They thought he was an apparition. It didn't say that they thought he was a disembodied, bodied spirit like we think of normally a spirit would be a ghost if you will they said no that, that's a, a phantasma that's a, that's a water willy that's a, that's a water monster it's Loch Ness come up in the Mediterranean Sea and it scared them they said we don't understand we don't what is this thing coming to us on the water they thought it was some sort of a fantasy you see they did not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ in peril. Remember, he sent them there. But they could not conceive that Jesus had righteous purpose in doing so. The things that happen to us in our life, sometimes, you know, I get to, to pouting a little bit. And I say, why would God allow something like that to happen? I don't understand this thing. You know, I thought the Supreme Court had our backs. All these years, Brother Mike, I have said, you know, that Supreme Court is stacked with liberal people, and you know, they're going to hear justice, and if someone naturally has a complaint, well, the Supreme Court's going to investigate. And so what did the Supreme Court do? They went, <laughs> Lord, Lord, I don't understand that. Where am I at? What country is I'm, am I living in? Did you know there's someone in the military who's head of the military now that says our greatest danger is the extremists in the army? They're now going to go through the army and see which political party you are because if you're the wrong party, they're going to go, pop, you're on the bad boy list. Where are we living? Could God have righteous purpose in allowing this? Amen. Think about it. Well, let's summarize here before I start on my message. <laughs> <laughs> Do we believe all things work together for good? And we're going to look at Romans chapter 
8 and 28, and I've printed that there on the, on the sheet. But, you know, do we, do we really believe that all things work together for his good? When we face adversity, do, do we blame God, or do we look for him in it? You see, those disciples were not expecting to see the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was there. And you know what? It says in verse 48 of Mark, it said, And Christ, in their peril, when they saw him and thought he was a, a fantasy, it says he would have passed them by. Why? Would you want Christ to pass you by in your peril and in your trouble? They didn't perceive him. You think it could be part of our problem? Is that when we have troubles and trials, we don't look for the Lord Jesus Christ in those trials. If we faced illogical hardships, do we have faith enough to perceive the Lord Jesus Christ in them? And will we reflect him that we know him even when we're in trial. Remember Daniel's companions there in the fiery furnace? And I printed Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. We won't read it, but essentially what it says is, they told the king, listen, our God can deliver us through this fire and out of this fire if he wants to. And guess what? If he doesn't want to, we're still not going to bow down. Amen. That's faith. <clears throat> That's trust. And remember when Nebuchadnezzar looked into that fire, he didn't see three people. He saw four people, and the fourth one was what? Like the Son of God. Those three companions of Daniel, going into that furnace with that attitude, they reflected the Lord Jesus Christ. What do people see as they observe me in my trial? Do they see Christ? Do we reflect him, you see? I trust that we will reflect him. Today we're going to go back to the same incident. This is my second message on the same passage, and Lord willing, I'm going to speak the third message on this same thing. We're going to go back to the same incident, Mark chapter 6. And there are other lessons we can learn from this passage. Let me tell you something. The Word of God is marvelous. Amen. You think that, that Mark and John are opposed in how they describe this scene? They are not. And every word of differentiation and difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John covering the same incident has an eternal divine purpose. Amen. And if you think the scripture is wrong, you and I are going to have some hard arguments. So we're going to go back to the same passage and consider it again. And again, we ask the question, if, since, knowing that Jesus is and was morally impeccable, do we value his workings in our life more? And is our faith grounded in him alone? Notice, if you will, three things concerning Romans chapter 8, verse 28, as I printed on that sheet. First of all, the first one is there's a promise there. And we know that all things work together for good. Now, that's God's good. That's the promise. Then look at another part. This second part says, to them that love God. That's our activity. That's our involvement in it, okay? To them that love God. Do we really love God? And then the third part is, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's his part. Now, I'm not talking about salvation. But if you look at verses that pertain to discipleship, there are generally three parts. There's a promise, there's a statement, and there's our activity, and there's God's activity. And I want to focus on those two aspects of the believer's life in peril. Now, first of all, from Mark's gospel, and I'm referring to the little box insert there in Mark chapter 6 and John 6. Notice from Mark's gospel, Jesus came 
about the fourth watch of the night. Here is emphasized two items. The time that he came to him, notice it was about the fourth watch. The time that he came to them. And secondly, the timing was of his initiation. Time, and it was his initiation. It says in verse 48, about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them. Let's summarize that. He initiated his choice to come, and the element of this was time-related, about the fourth watch of the night. Now, the first watch of, uh, of the day were, was really an even. In the evening, it was called, the first watch was called the evening watch, and that's from about 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch is the midnight watch, from 9 p.m. to 12 a.m., the third watch is called the cock crowing, and that's from 12 a.m. until 3 a.m. And the fourth watch is called the morning watch. That's 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. God accomplishes his will based on his timing. Amen. Regarding God as deficient in his timing or accusing him as being tardy is a sinful idea. And it's typical of the last day scoffers in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. How sad that is. It's God's initiation. It's God's timing when he acts in our life. Consider Israel fleeing the Egyptian chariots from Exodus 14 verses 24 and 25. We'll not read it, but it says they were running and they were fleeing and about the fourth what? <laughs> about the fourth watch of the night? What? The wheels fell off the chariots. When we were in, the, in Cairo, Egypt several years ago, we went to the museum there, which has been partly destroyed now. And we saw chariot wheels that would have been very similar to the ones that Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh said, Pharaohs, <laughs> chariots, that, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> chariots that Pharaoh used, they had some that were very similar in the shape of their spokes, which they have found in the Red Sea. And you know, it says that the, these chariot wheels came off about the fourth watch very early. I can imagine those Israelites were thinking as they watched them coming, as they heard them coming, and they said, oh, where's God? He's, he doesn't care anymore. But he does. Mm -hmm. He comes at his time. What a lesson for us. God will do his part. When trials come, the timing is his. And when deliverance comes, the timing is his. Notice in verse 48 it says, and he saw them toiling. Don't ever think that God does not see you. I don't care what your burden or problem might be. God sees you. He sees me toiling. God is not unaware. God didn't save us and then just shut us in some little redemption compartment and little bin. God sees each one. Everyone who has put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ himself and no other is our great high priest. And it says that the Lord Jesus Christ to those who are saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is before the face of God the Father as I speak. And as you sit here today, Christ is there on our behalf. Amen. Thank you. And Christ saw these disciples and they were toiling. Those grumpy, criticizing disciples, we need you, God. And the Lord says, okay, you need me. Let me demonstrate how much you need me. And he sends them into a storm. And when they get there, they don't recognize the storm. 
that comes from God. They say it's a water phantasma. It's a fantasy. It's something scary. And it says that the Lord would have just passed them by. Think about that. About the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them. Our faith should be in him. He comes in his perfect and purposeful time. Will we trust him alone to accomplish he's good? Now let's consider the same event from John's gospel printed on the right side in that column there. John chapter 6, uh, verses 18 through about 21. Notice the demarcation in verse 19a. So when they had wrote about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, you notice the difference there? Notice the difference in measure. In Mark, he came at a certain time. Here in John, he came at a what? A certain distance. Do you see the difference? And the act of person is different. In Mark, it says, he came in his element of time, <coughs> he cometh unto them. But notice in John, it says, about, after they'd gone about, you know, so far, they saw him. There's those two parts again. His part and our part. In John, we act. They see Jesus walking. So while Mark points to God in his time, John points to us and our progress. They had gone about five and twenty or thirty furlongs. Progress. So we might ask the question, what has been our progress in the Christian pathway? Think about it. How long have you been saved? When was the day, and I hope you remember the day that you actually bowed your head and confessed as a sinner helpless before God, and put faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thereby, having faith in God's promise, you now have salvation and have the Spirit of God residing inside you and have that great high priest on high. Can you remember that day? If you can't remember that day, have you ever really done that? And if you haven't done that, make it today. Mm -hmm. Make it during this meeting, even as I speak. Or come up to me after the meeting is over and say, Brother Dan, I want to nail this down. I want to publicly confess the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me ask you, since you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, what progress have we made? What does God see? He sees our progress. Genesis, Galatians 4, 9 to 11, he says, but now after, the, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? He's stolen them. Galatians 5, 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? <laughs> Sometimes people don't make progress. Hebrews 5, 12, for when you, the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of man. You see, we need to make progress in our Christian life. And note, if you will, in John chapter 6 and verse 19, it was not a definite distance, was it? He said they had traveled about 25 or 30 furlongs, about. Let, let me just ask you something. God is not looking so much for a, an exact measure like you're, I'm starting you on a 100-yard on a dash and when you get to 99, then I'm going to help you. no. He says that they were about this distance and, and he sees them toiling. And then at that time, at about that distance, they, doing their part, they perceive him. 
You know, from Matthew chapter 14, um, we read the account of, of this same account where Peter walks on water. And you know, the point that is most often pointed out is the failure of Peter. Bad boy, pat, slap, slap. Let me ask you something. Out of all those disciples in that little boat, who made the most progress? Amen. <clears throat> Are we going to slap Peter forever? Oh, he was, he was imperfect, but nobody else even got out of the boat. And he may have failed, and he doubted. I don't even know if he acted in faith, asking faith, because he says, if you're really the Son of God, bid me to come. And if he was walking on water, why did he, why did he look away? I don't know. I can't answer those questions. But I tell you what, he got out of the boat. Let me ask us something of ourselves this morning. Have we ever got out of the boat? Mm -hmm. What's been our progress in the Christian life? God's part. He comes at his time. Our part. It's our volition and our progress. It's our faith and our progress. What has been our effort and progress along the Christian pathway? God sees us toiling. But what does he re see regarding our progress? You know, I, I, I sometimes have a, have a tendency to, to whimper and cry, you know. I'm going to pout. And maybe, you know, since God can't see my heart, I might accuse him. Oh, he can't see our heart, can he? Mm -hmm. Or do we wrongly attribute the workings of God to Satan and say, oh, there's a, there's a spook out there, there's an evil something. Or do, do we see? Christ in tribulation? Do we still believe that he is good? Do we believe that everything he does is good? Then why would we challenge the situation we might be going through? All things work for good. One last thought on this event and seeing Christ in our trials <coughs> and looking again at that little inset there in John chapter 6. Uh, verses 18 through 21. You know, in, in verse 18, God sends the wind and the waves. They are from him. And they say they see Jesus. Then they fear. They thought him to be an apparition. He identifies himself in verse 20, and he says, be not afraid. And then when we come to verse 21, we have a very interesting little sequence there. First, Upon recognizing him, they invite him into the ship. You know, when we go through trials, do we look for the Lord? Mm -hmm. And if you see the Lord, and even by faith in that trial, why not invite him into the ship? Think about that. And now we come in this verse... Not only did they recognize him and invite him into the ship, but the fourth miracle occurs. It says, immediately, the ship was docked at land. Mm. Now think about it. They had only gone 25 or 30 furlongs, and when Christ got into the boat, they were at their destination. An interesting thought. It's one of God's purposes accomplished when we recognize him in our tribulation and invite him and feed on him and focus on him in our trial. And when we do that, maybe the trial is over. Mm -hmm. Christ is in the boat with us. Do we recognize him? Or do we live in constant fear? And do we not see him in tribulations and in the way that he has brought us along? And we reach out and we say, Lord Jesus, I see you in this trial. I will not give Satan even the credit for it, but I want you. 
And when we receive him, when we perceive him, and when we invite him into our life circumstance, all of a sudden, we're sure. We're where we should be. And that is trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in Mark 6.45, it says that Jesus constrained them to go to the other side. He constrained them. That, that's a, a very forceful word. He, he was kind of like he was twisting your arm. He says, I'm the captain. Get in the boat. Wow, that's pretty stern, isn't it? Now remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is impeccable. I have no accusation here, but that's what it says. He constrained them to get into that boat. Physically, they were to go to the other side. But their efforts in rowing to get there ceased. And here we get a spiritual lesson. When? When they recognized Jesus and Christ got into the boat. Again, could one of God's purposes be accomplished when we acknowledge him in all that besets us? God's reason for sending him into the storm, I believe, was finished. It was accomplished at this time. He taught them lessons he says, yeah, these, this multitude has great need, and I ministered to it. And then the disciples who grumbled, they found themselves in great need. And who solved the problem? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ gave food to the multitude. The Lord Jesus Christ came, and he rescued the disciples in the midst of this storm. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, let your conversation, that is your manner of living, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Do we believe that? After this election, after we see what's going on in, in Congress now, do we believe that? Proverbs 3, 6, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. What if there's a storm there? Are we going to double our fist up at God? Are we going to attribute that, that uh, tribulation to Satan and, and curse at him and so forth and so forth? We're going to look for the Lord Jesus Christ and his purpose and say, okay, I take everything from your hand. I want you in the boat. Don't pass me by. Don't leave me. Come into the boat and be in the circumstance with me. If we were playing a game called poker and I realized that all of you are Christians and you've never gambled, <laughs> you don't know what poker is, but poker is a gambling game. You can smile quietly. <laughs> we know what that means. Are you all in? That means when someone thinks they have a hand that's that's unbeatable, you know, where they take all those chips or all that money and they shove it all in the middle of the table. I'm all in. And sometimes those people are bluffing, aren't they? And someone has a better hand and they're all out. But when it comes to God and faith and his provision, in his dealings with us. Do we consider him good? Do we consider him just? And when something bad happens, do we say, Lord, I don't understand it. I'm all in. I'm all in for you. You know, in Genesis chapter 31, and we'll close with this thought, Jacob was told to go back to his uh, home country where Esau was. Now remember, he kind of tricked Esau out of the birthright, you know, and, and Jacob was pretty antsy concerning Esau. He says, maybe my brother's going to cut my throat. But you know, God told him, he says, Jacob, I want you to go back there. I'm going to be with you. Now what should Jacob do? Why well, you say, that's obvious. He should have just gone back because the word of God said God was going to be with him. Oh, is that how we react to troubles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what did Jacob do? You know, Jacob, we had someone here 
used to have somebody on my name, Jacob. That's still my favorite name. Mm. And it, it is. My, I, could, I could take the name Jacob so easy. <laughs> but you know, what did Jacob do? It, as, as he got near, his brother near, near, he went, you know what? Jaden, he did this. He was smart. He divided all his possessions into four groups. And so the first group, when they came to Esau, they were to say, Esau, we're from your brother Jacob, and here's a bunch of cows and a bunch of sheep, you know, and, 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 and Jacob wants you to have these as a present because he loves you so much. And Jacob says, you know what, Esau will get mad, and if he's really mad at me, he'll kill all that first group of people. Oh, wouldn't you like to be in the first group? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> And then he invited a third group, and he says, you know, we'll send them along a little ways after. And the second group, and finally in the very, very last group, here comes Jacob and his wife and his children. Did he trust God? Did he see God in all that? And remember how Jacob was spared. Do we hold back? Or are we all in? when it comes to putting our faith in God our Savior. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word, so rich in its meanings, Father. Help us to not only read it, but help us, Father, to understand it, and most of all, help us to apply it. Father, help us to understand thy love for us in the detail of thy provision. And help us, Father, to reach out by faith and see you in every circumstance. May we reflect you to others in it as they see us. May we invite you into our ship. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his impeccable life. We see how he dealt with his disciples, O oh Lord. So deal with us and cause us to trust thee. Father, again we pray if there's one here who knows not thee as Savior, mm -hmm. that this very morning they would come and put their trust in you. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask these things in the worthy and precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.